Chapter Number Nine of Trading Jeff and His Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Trading Jeff and His Dog by Jim Kilgard. Chapter Nine. Mighty Mission. In his room at the Kennard, Jeff slept late. The past four days had been busy ones and more than a little hectic, and he was tired. Mr. Calworth himself had brought back three of the cheapest knives. Admittedly, they were worth five dollars each, but they were not merchandise that Ryerson could sell to its more exacting customers. If they were to pay premium prices, they demanded premium quality and Ryerson had better knives in stock that they sold for four dollars and a half. However, Mr. Calworth had softened their return by taking the fringed hunting shirt, the four pairs of moccasins, and the polished hunting horn, and privately Jeff kicked himself for failing to offer them in the first place. They had brought thirty-eight dollars, and Ryerson's would take all Jeff could supply if the quality remained as good. The pistol was also gone. Failing to sell it to anyone at the price he wanted to get, Jeff had carelessly left it on his dresser. The maid who tidied up the room had found it, decided that only a desperate outlaw would use such a thing, and taken it to the clerk. Unable to resolve a situation so grave, and unwilling to take the responsibility, the clerk had consulted the manager, and the manager had come to see Jeff. He apologized for his employees, but thought that they had been well-intentioned. He also recognized the pistol, and it just so happened that his hobby was collecting antique firearms, if Jeff cared to sell the pistol. Jeff did, for fifteen dollars. Jeff had tramped the streets, going from store to store and bartering. It had taken time but bit by bit he had rid himself of almost everything he had brought to Ackerton, and stocked his pack with items the hill people favoured. None of it had cost Jeff any money, and in addition to all expenses he had a clear profit of almost a hundred dollars. Under ordinary circumstances that would have been excellent, but these circumstances were not ordinary. He had been unable to find a buyer for either the miniatures or Granny Wilson's tapestries though it revolted his peddler's instincts to do so he was willing to keep the miniatures if it took too much time to sell them not only did he refuse to do so with granny's tapestries but he was determined to settle for nothing less than the price he had assured granny that he could get however at least for the moment he had reached a stalemate jeff had visited every store that seemed to have a wealthy trade but the most expensive tapestry he had been shown cost twelve dollars and fifty cents, and he hadn't even bothered to show Granny's. Jeff turned over, opened his eyes, sat up, yawned, and occupied his mind with the problems of the day. The smile remained on his lips, and his eyes retained their sparkle. The fact that he had had no success with the tapestries proved only that he had not yet offered them to the right person. They were a challenge, and it was a challenge to which he could rise. If he had permitted himself to be discouraged by every small setback, he would have stopped peddling long ago. He dressed, breakfasted, and lingered over his plate to ponder the problem of the tapestries. Naturally, one did not walk up to any stranger, ask him if he needed an expensive tapestry, and proceed to sell him one but there had to be a way because there was always a way what way jeff tried his best to come up with an answer and couldn't do it he still had no intention of leaving ackerton until the tapestries were sold jeff fell back on the idea that first things must be first and he still had more to do in ackerton maybe something would occur to him while he was doing it he went to his room referred to the directory found the jackson school for boys noted its address on a slip of paper and tucked one of granny's tapestries the last supper 
under his arm before he left the hotel far from doing so only once opportunity was always knocking and jeff thought that many people missed her visit only because they were unprepared when she was all but hammering the door from its hinges he took a taxi across town there were trolleys but he hadn't acquainted himself with their schedules and besides taxis were faster now that time was a factor he wanted to finish his business and return to smithville he could not afford to loiter jeff looked interestedly at the section of the city they were entering downtown ackerton was crowded with land so precious there was no room for any space at all between buildings even the more modest residential areas had houses close together and a bit of yard in front and back this must be where the wealthy element lived the houses were large and set back from the streets by ackerton's standards the lawns were very spacious though all of them together wouldn't have offered a hill dweller as much room as he needed they came to an area where there were no residences at all but only a few business places and jeff had a fleeting glimpse of one that interested him the display windows were clear but drapes hung behind them and jeff thought he saw a tapestry displayed he memorized the name the murchison galleries the cabby turned aside into a paved drive and halted his taxi beside a large building that had a distinct air of gentility the taxi stopped and jeff looked puzzled i wanted the jackson school this is it jeff paid the driver got out and looked around obviously a converted mansion the jackson school had none of the aloofness of the mansions they had passed surrounded by green lawns and flower gardens there was that same strong sense of being welcome that was so evident on granny wilson's hill jeff whistled johnny blazer who had lived in a cabin behind smithville hadn't stinted himself when he chose a school for his son jeff knew a little misgivings it was his intention to see dan back here when the school term opened but could he afford it might as well find out he murmured to himself inside the main entrance a pleasant girl looked up from a desk upon which was a typewriter an inkwell with a tray of pens and a few papers she smiled at jeff yes i'd like to see jeff tried and could not think of the titles given officials in private schools for boys he grinned i'd like to discuss a youngster who probably would be in the sixth grade is he a student here yes i'll call mr nelson will you be seated please she talked into a speaking tube jeff seated himself on a comfortable divan and as soon as he saw him he approved of the man who came in about fifty years old he was short and inclined to stoutness he wore a gray suit that fitted well and had been chosen with care his face was flushed and his hair iron gray but the blue eyes that set his face off were gentle understanding and wise jeff rose to meet him mr nelson yes sir his voice was soft and pleasant my name's jeff tarrant jeff introduced himself i've come to talk to you about dan blazer alert interest flooded the headmaster's face oh yes do you know where he is yes let me tell you mr nelson listened attentively while jeff spoke of finding dan in johnny blazer's cabin jeff told of dan's fierce anger and his unshakable determination to seek out whoever had killed his father and extract full vengeance he spoke of his own part in it and of the paper loaded shotgun shells jeff did not try to conceal the fact that he was a peddler nor did he hide dan's interest in peddling he told of his own hopes to find johnny's murderer let the law take its course and of the effect he thought that would have on dan for a moment after he finished mr nelson did not speak and then he asked where is the boy now i left him in very good hands he will lack for nothing mr nelson looked troubled what do you intend to do with him mr tarrant if i can afford it i want to bring him back here when the fall term opens 
Mr. Nelson smiled gently. Mr. Tarrant, when you looked up the Jackson School for Boys, I'm sure you saw nothing about our being restricted to wealthy boys only. We do have students, and I'll admit they are of exceptional ability, who pay whatever their parents or guardians can afford. Where does Dan rate in that category? Very highly, very highly, I assure you, an outstanding youngster, but your revelations were not a complete surprise. You expected him to run away? I took him to his father's funeral, Mr. Nelson said softly. He said little, but I knew what he was thinking. After he ran away, I wrote to the authorities in Smithville, but I've had no reply. That's my fault, Jeff admitted. I told them that Dan was under my care and that I'd contact you personally. You did? By any chance did you have any ideas about looking us over? I had that idea, and I had no intention of letting him come back if you did not measure up. Oh, we do meet your standards? Jeff smiled. You're good enough. You might have brought Dan with you. I might also have put him in a cage, Jeff said wryly. And if I kept him there for one, three, or ten years, he'd get out sometime, and when he did, he'd still go back and hunt whoever shot his father. How old are you, Mr. Tarrant? Going on nineteen. Would it be impertinent to ask your background? Jeff said quietly. I lived in an orphanage until I was a little past fourteen. Then I ran away and worked at various jobs. Since quitting the last one, I've been a peddler. I see. And what do you hope to gain by sending this youngster back to us? Jeff still spoke quietly. Sleep, easy sleep at night, because I did not leave him alone when he had no one else to whom he could turn. What does Dan think about it? I haven't told him, Jeff grinned, but I have a pact with him. Dan has agreed to do anything I say. Why? He likes peddling, and he has an idea that he's going to throw in with me. I told him he couldn't unless he minded me. What are your plans for the future? I haven't decided, Jeff said seriously, but I like Smithville, and if things continue to go as well as they started out, in the next three or four years I'll be able to build up a good business right here in Smithville. I see. Do you have any ideas about Dan's throwing in with you? Yes, I do, Jeff confessed. I like him, and I'd like to have him. Tarrant and Blazer would be a mighty good team, but first he must have an education. Why? So he'll know what I've never learned. I read as much as I can, but that's not as good as solid groundwork in school. If you pay for his education, would you insist on his later services? No. He can choose his own way. You're willing to be responsible for him on such a basis? Yes, sir. What is your tuition fee? Mr. Blazer paid. Mr. Nelson named half the sum Jeff had expected. What do you wish to have me do? I want only your written confirmation that Dan is in my care. May I also say that you are to return him to us by September 14th? Certainly. All right. Miss Jackson, may I borrow your desk? The confirming letter in an inside pocket, Jeff strode happily out of the school. It had all been much simpler than he thought possible, but Mr. Nelson was an understanding person. Jeff knew that he himself had undergone one of the most severe examinations of his life, and had passed it. Relieved about Dan, he could now give his whole attention to the business at hand. It was a long way to Kennard, but Jeff did not want to hail or phone for a taxi as yet, because the neighborhood and the stores he had seen interested him. He walked back the way he had come, saw the stores ahead, and halted in front of the Murchison Galleries. He wanted to assure himself that he had seen what he thought he had seen, and it was there, in the window, 
somehow accentuated by the very simplicity of its surroundings was a tapestry that depicted a bowl of crocuses in bloom though he did not know a great deal about tapestries jeff realized that this was a very fine one but mentally he compared it to granny's and decided that hers was better jeff entered the galleries though only fair size the arrangement of the interior loaned an illusion of spaciousness and its air was one of quiet refinement there were paintings on the walls and others on easels and without examining them too closely jeff knew that the way they were placed added much to their effectiveness he turned to meet the man coming toward him and was greeted with a pleasant good morning he said it as though he were welcoming a guest into his house and jeff responded in kind good morning i think you may save my life indeed the man arched his brows you hardly seem on the verge of expiring i really am though you do know something about tapestries a bit the man smiled indulgently what do you wish jeff unrolled granny's the last supper and held it up for inspection i must find the exact duplicate of this may i see it the man took the tapestry felt its texture turned it over and examined it at arm's length his eyes hardened ever so slightly lowering the tapestry he wrinkled his brow in thought perhaps we may help you mr tarrant jeff supplied jeffrey tarrant i'm raoul murchison you wish us to find a duplicate of this if you can jeff wanted twenty-five dollars but decided he might as well try for more it's worth a hundred dollars how soon must you have it mr tarrant tomorrow noon's the deadline jeff said ruefully just think i've been in ackerson almost a week before i found you where are you staying the kennard room sixteen may we retain this until tomorrow at noon of course naturally you will naturally i would not ask you to leave it without a receipt will you be at the kennard at noon i'll make it a point to be there i shall phone you then mr tarrant and advise you concerning our success or failure he gave jeff a receipt and noted his name and room number jeff left the galleries knowing that he had taken a gamble but he who hoped to win had to take chances with nothing else to do he gave the rest of the day and most of the next morning to wandering about ackerton he returned to his room at twenty to twelve and exactly twenty minutes later his phone rang mr tarrant it was the desk clerk there's a mr murchison here to see you send him up jeff opened the door for raoul murchison and no matter where he stood he would still be master of the murchison galleries i came in person mr tarrant because that seemed best indeed yes we succeeded in locating the exact duplicate of your tapestry jeff gave thanks for his ability to wear a poker face when such was in order if the murchison galleries had located the twin of granny's the last supper granny had made it and raoul murchison wouldn't even know how to talk to her murchison smiled tentatively in the process of finding the duplicate we also found a customer who was enamored of the pair those things happen i assume that you have a customer who will pay you at least two hundred dollars jeff made no comment it was murchison's privilege to assume anything he wished the art dealer continued i am prepared to offer you a hundred and twenty-five dollars for yours jeff's heart leaped but his face revealed nothing obviously somewhere among his wealthy neighbors raoul murchison just as jeff had hoped had known the exact person who would appreciate such a tapestry naturally he would sell it for more than the price offered jeff but he was entitled to a profit too hiding his elation jeff frowned it isn't the price i thought i'd get but you cannot sell yours without a duplicate jeff looked away without answering murchison waited expectantly 
Finally, Jeff looked back. Well, all right, he agreed. How about taking another tapestry? Jeff asked. Oh, you have another? Jeff showed him the fall of Satan. Raoul Murchison examined it and turned to Jeff. A fair enough piece, and I'll speculate. Shall we say fifty dollars? Let's say seventy-five. I'm taking a chance, but will you accept my personal check? Certainly. Raoul Murchison wrote a check and waved it in the air until it dried. If you should be in Ackerton again, Mr. Tarrant, the Murchison galleries are ever ready to be of service. He left, and Jeff leaped high to click his heels in the air. He had hoped to get fifty dollars for both tapestries. He had two hundred, and a strong hint that more tapestries would be welcome. He fairly danced down to the desk. When is the next train for Delview? he asked. The clerk consulted a timetable. Five three. Thanks. Jeff ran out on the street and hailed a taxi. The nearest place where I can buy a kitten, he directed. And stay with me. I want you all afternoon. Sure, bub. Half past four and five pet shops later, Jeff found what he wanted. Of three white Angora kittens in the window, one was almost the twin of Granny's departed pet. It watched Jeff shyly and arched its back against his hand, and then it promptly proceeded to bite his finger. Plainly, it was a kitten with character. I want it, Jeff told the astonished proprietor. Put it in a cage or something, because it's going on the train. Lifted into a second-hand bird cage, the kitten spat its indignation and fell to swiping its shadows with a silky paw. Jeff laid five dollars, the requested price on the counter, and thrust his hand into the pocket where the miniatures lay. Present for you, he said, scattering them across the counter. He rushed to the cab. Hotel Kennard, and don't spare the gasoline. I have to be at the station at five two. He made it with a whole minute to spare. End of chapter nine. Chapter Ten of Trading Jeff and His Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Trading Jeff and His Dog by Jim Kilgard. Chapter Ten Bombshell. Dan Blazer, going up the trail toward Granny Wilson's with a shotgun in one hand and Pal's leash in the other, was a little angry and more than a little resentful. Though Jeff had said that Dan was going to take care of Granny, the boy had convinced himself that he was actually to be taken care of. He resented it because he and Jeff had a pact. Dan had promised to do anything Jeff said, but Jeff seemed to have forgotten. If he wanted to stay at Granny's, he had only to say so, and nothing else was necessary. Dan turned to pull the balky pal along. Come on, he ordered. Come on, pal. Jeff's going to Ackerton, and he doesn't want either you or me with him. Pal, who had wanted to go with Jeff, but who was beginning to get the idea that he was not supposed to, stopped straining back on the leash. He was not wholly abandoned as he had been when Johnny went away, and that was a comfort. Dan brightened a little. Jeff had not only let him have the shotgun and the six shells, but had insisted that he take them. The very fact that Jeff had trusted him with both made him feel more like a man and less like a little boy. He gripped the shotgun tightly. Some day he would look down that rib that separated its two barrels and see the man who had shot his father. Dan's eyes flashed and then softened. That day must not be now. He had promised Jeff that he wouldn't shoot anybody, and Jeff was very smart. Dan skipped along. Save for the one dark cloud, the future glowed with bright promise. Jeff had promised to make a peddler of him and that would be the ideal life. 
Dan thought of it during his waking moments and dreamed of it in his sleep. All he had to do in order to make his dreams come true was obey Jeff, and that was a small price to pay for the reward it offered. Jeff was all wise, all good, all powerful, and maybe he had really sent Dan to take care of Granny. When Granny's green hill came in sight, Dan's spirits were almost completely lifted. The fact that he wished so desperately to take a man's part helped convince him that he was taking one, and he forgot his resentment to greet Granny with a smile. Good morning, Granny. Dan, my land, where's Jeff? Gone to Ackerton, and he'll be gone for some time. He, Dan hesitated. He sent me and Pal up to look after you while he's away. Granny reacted precisely as Jeff thought she would. Now that was a kindly thought. I really miss a man around the house. Come in and let me set you a dish of cookies. Granny's wholehearted acceptance of himself and his mission removed most of the lingering suspicion Dan retained that Granny was really supposed to take care of him. He swelled with newfound importance and felt a profound gratitude toward Jeff for sending him on a man's job. The cookies Granny set before him were tangible proof that taking care of her would not be without its rewards. With the appetite of a dragon and the digestion of a goat, and despite his substantial breakfast, Dan finished all the cookies and wished there were more, but it would hardly be polite to ask. I can stay until Jeff gets back, Granny, he said. You won't have to worry while I'm here. I won't, she asserted. I just won't fret even one particle. It's such a comfort to have you. What's Jeff doing in Ackerton? Trading. We've been working pretty hard, and now he has to trade everything we've got. Dan thought wistfully of Jeff, who in the boy's mind was nine feet tall and possessed all the capacities of a wizard. He'll do all right, too. Those city people, they're not near as smart as Jeff. They couldn't be, Granny agreed solemnly, that Jeff, he's a man all through. We're partners, Dan said, partners in everything. Any of those Whitney's been bothering you, Granny? Not of late. Granny looked a bit puzzled. Why do you ask about the Whitney's? Because, Dan said fiercely, one of them shot my pop and soon's Jeff and me find out which one, we're going to shoot him. My land, how you talk. Dan felt suddenly that he was a little boy again, and justly censured by an adult for lack of wisdom. He all but blushed. We're not going to do it right away. That's nice, Granny said. Now I have to take care of you. What needs taking care of first? You might go see that no pesky thing's troubling my sheep. Pal at his heels, Dan raced down to where the fat sheep were at their endless task of cropping grass. They looked at him with mildly surprised eyes and continued to crop. Dan circled the sheep three times, petted the gentle creatures, and was more than a little disappointed because there seemed to be no immediate need of his protective services. But he did not lose hope. There was still a lot of Granny's Hill left. Molly, Granny's placid old cow, and Ephraim, Granny's mule, were as well off as the sheep. Dan sighed, then became a little excited when four blackbirds winged out of the trees to scratch in Granny's garden. He stalked them carefully, but before he could come near enough, Pal charged the blackbirds and sent them in jittery flight back to the trees. Dan circled the foot of the hill, looking hard for something from which Granny should be protected, but all he found was a cottontail rabbit that confounded the fleet pal by ducking into a burrow three inches in front of his nose. Dan wandered back to Granny's house just in time for lunch. That consisted of bread much softer and better than any Abel Tarkman sold butter, delicately spiced strawberry preserves, goblets of milk, and a crisp apple turnover smothered in cream, was better than any Dan had eaten, even at Jackson School for Boys. Suddenly homesick, he thought of the school and all it had meant to him, and then put the thought behind him. He had left the school because he was driven by a mission that would not let him rest, 
and would never permit him to have peace until it was fulfilled until it was he must think of nothing else he shouldn't even think seriously of going peddling with jeff but he couldn't help that then his faith restored itself jeff was all-wise and all-powerful jeff had promised him that justice would be done and dan was a bit ashamed of his doubts unable to swallow another bite he pushed his plate back and lingered over it granny who hadn't had a hungry boy to satisfy in far too long was shaping an apple pie at the table and dan's eyes lingered on her the big wood stove cast a pleasant glow into the room and tantalizing odors promised much to come dan licked his lips the faint beginning of fresh hunger rising on the very heels of the meal he had just eaten dan wrinkled his brows he'd been sent to look after granny and look after her he would but she didn't seem to need any looking after right now and the forest surrounding the hill was an inviting place he asked is everything all right granny land it's right as rain since you got here haven't felt this safe in a dog's age would you still feel safe if pal and me went down into the woods this afternoon can you beat that i was just about to ask you if you would what you going to do there dan look around and make sure nothing's lurking too near good good if you can spare the time you might bring a few trout for us to sup on oh boy dan whooped from his chair with pal bustling at his heels he ran out to the garden he loved to fish his father had taught him how to catch trout and granny's accustomed tackle a hook and line tied to a willow pole hung over the door in the spring's damp overflow dan grubbed until he had filled his pockets with fat worms and then he snatched the pole from over the doorway and raced down to the little stream that ran from the hilltop wound like a silver ribbon through the forest he strung a worm on his hook crawled cautiously up to a pool and dropped the worm gently watching with bated breath the ripples that spread a trout surged from the depths struck viciously and dan drew his wriggling catch in deftly he slipped it onto a willow stringer stringer in one hand pole in the other he sneaked up to another pool and caught another trout mindful of the pies granny was making he decided he needed no more than two trout for himself because his appetite must be saved for more important things granny might eat three dan had four trout on his stringer when pal growled hackles raised ears alert nose questing he peered upstream dan stopped not knowing what was coming but sure that pal wouldn't growl for no reason dragging the dog with him the boy slipped into the brush and a moment later bar whitney appeared he was fishing too but instead of a willow stringer he carried a buckskin creel into which he slipped trout as he caught them dan held his breath and at the same time did his best to control his rising rage he wished mightily that he had brought the shotgun but so far there had been no indication that he would need it watching bar come nearer he made himself very small if he did not move maybe bar wouldn't see him but when the man came opposite dan he swerved and splashed across the creek trousers dripping seeming like some wet monster that emerged from the water he had only a glance for the growling pal but he thrust a hand inside his shirt and the boy knew that he had a weapon of some sort concealed there dan quieted the growling pal by gently stroking him what ye be doing here boy dan glared i don't talk to no blame whitney's bar's eyes clouded mind your tongue boy i won't mind it but one of you whitney's will wish you'd minded yourselves when jeff and me find out who killed my pop we will yes you will and me and jeff are on the track you be jeff's image came to stand beside dan so that he no longer felt small alone and so terribly frightened with his friend beside him he could do anything ha he exploded you think jeff's a peddler but he's not 
dan cast desperately for an apt description and thought of the most awesome image his mind could conjure up he's a policeman a real policeman now he's gone into ackerton for more policemen and soon's he gets some they'll get every one of you darn whitneys you wait you'll be sorry jeff said so so bar whitney purred so aren't you aren't you going to do anything to me can't think of airy i do except maybe string you on a hook and use you for bait no longer interested in fishing bar whitney splashed back across the creek and disappeared into the forest immensely gratified dan watched him go he'd told those whitneys except that the fluffy kitten did not like the bird cage and expressed his dislike with frequent far carrying meows that attracted the attention of everyone else in the day coach jeff's trip from ackerton to delview was almost routine it was not entirely so because twice the conductor threatened either to take the kitten into the baggage car or throw jeff and his luggage off the train both times a chorus of dissent rose from the six other passengers in the car the train did not make as many stops as the one from delview to ackerton had but it was equally slow and the kitten provided diversion when they finally reached delview the kitten stood erect and glared at everything in sight obviously he was a creature of great character and he would fit in perfectly on granny's hill pack on his back and the caged kitten dangling from his right hand jeff strode down delview's main street he had decided as he usually did to guide himself by whatever circumstances seemed to require if he felt too tired he would put up at one of delview's two hotels overnight but the events of the day particularly his astounding success with granny's tapestries had roused him to a pitch of enthusiasm so high that he was not at all tired the star-lighted night was ideal for walking and jeff made up his mind to go right through to smithville he should get there some time in the early morning hours he was anxious to see dan again and to watch granny's eyes when he told her what he had done with her tapestries he was hungry but the first cafe he entered was one of delview's exclusive eating places and the late diners who lingered there stared in horror at the caged kitten a waiter asked him to leave and jeff did not feel like arguing the point the second cafe not so pretentious and presided over by a fat man with a completely bald head and a clean apron was less particular jeff laid his pack down put the cage on a chair and ordered steak fried potatoes and coffee heavy on all three and a saucer of milk for the kitten sure bud sure the fat man poked a pudgy finger at the kitten who crouched in the cage and evidently imagined himself unseen he sprang suddenly and when he leaped against the cage's door it burst open the kitten slithered through jumped to the table gave everything in the restaurant a haughty look scrambled to jeff's shoulder and began to purr contentedly cute little fella the fat man said admiringly why do you keep him caged jeff saw opportunity the cage had only been a means for getting the kitten from ackerton to granny's but if the kitten preferred jeff's shoulder he was welcome to ride there the fat man was obviously interested in the cage usually i don't jeff admitted i got the cage to bring him through from ackerton he added as though it were an afterthought darn thing cost me two dollars hmm need the cage any more i don't know my wife's been looking for such she keeps birds what do you take for it jeff forsook bargaining his pack was full and since the kitten seemed happy on his shoulder he didn't want to carry the cage to smithville swap for the dinner it's a swap the fat man who apparently was also the cook went into the kitchen and he came back with a platter containing a huge steak and an ample supply of potatoes he also had a mug of coffee that held at least a pint the kitten scrambled from jeff's shoulder to the tabletop turned up his nose at the saucer of milk placed before him and looked appealingly at jeff's steak jeff grinned this kitten knew what he wanted and was willing to try for it jeff fed him a small piece of steak 
and then another, and a third. Only when Jeff firmly refused to give him any more did he turn and lap up every bit of the milk. When it was time to go, he climbed back on Jeff's shoulder and pressed his naked nose and pads against his friend's neck, where they would stay warm. Jeff walked swiftly through the cool night, stopping every hour or so to rest. He enjoyed every second of it. Dawn was faint in the sky when they came to Smithville, and rising and stretching on Jeff's shoulder, the kitten greeted it with a hearty meow. "'Who's there?' It was the constable, Bill Ellis. "'Jeff Tarrant,' Jeff called. "'I've been waiting for you.' Even though the constable was only half seen, there was about him a great hesitation that was mingled with a certain furtiveness as he came through the darkness. Jeff waited, more than a little surprised. Bill Ellis came nearer and whispered, "'Where you been?' "'Why, Ackerton.' The kitten meowed again, and Bill Ellis took a backward step. "'What's that?' just a kitten that i'm bringing to granny wilson there was a vast urgency in bill ellis's voice as he said don't go there turn around and get out of the hills and don't come back why never mind why just go i'm going to granny's bill ellis's shrug was more sensed than seen you got a gun why no where is it at granny's by the way here's the letter from the school he took the letter from an inside pocket and handed it over. Bill Ellis accepted it, but it seemed unimportant. "'If you won't run,' he said, "'get to Granny's and get your gun while darkness lasts. Don't go anywhere again without it. But do as I say, and—' There was a definite note of fear in Bill Ellis's voice. "'Don't tell anybody I told you.' He turned and walked swiftly away, as though the peddler had suddenly become an outcast or tainted being with whom he must not have further contact. Jeff stood a moment, completely bewildered. Why, this unexpected warning? What had come into the hills since he'd left for Ackerton? Why was Bill Ellis afraid? Jeff called softly. Bill! The constable waited. Jeff trotted to him tell me some more i've told you enough don't go out unless you can protect yourself i can do nothing for you and the best thing you can do is run nobody would gun down an unarmed man don't be a fool i see bill did johnny blazer have a gun when he was found no leave me now it's growing lighter jeff resumed his journey up the road and the kitten stretched all four paws against his neck. Shaking his head uncertainly, he did not turn aside when he came to Johnny Blazer's cabin. Bill Ellis had told him to get to Granny's and arm himself before daylight. He'd better do it. The sun was just rising when Jeff came to Granny's green hill, and he heard Pal's happy roar of welcome. He quickened his steps, and even on this hill of peace, he had an uncomfortable feeling that he was watched by furtive eyes. Johnny Blazer had been shot down in cold blood. At the door he composed himself. Granny and Dan must not be worried. When he entered the cabin, an ecstatic pal flung himself forward, and Jeff tickled the big dog's ears. He turned to meet Granny, who always rose with the sun. Hiya, Granny, he plucked the kitten from his shoulder. I brought you a present. Oh, the love! Granny cuddled the kitten against her cheek, knowing experienced hands and instantly liking Granny almost as much as she loved him. The kitten licked her cheek with a pink tongue and fell to purring. Rubbing sleepy eyes, pajama clad Dan came from his bedroom. Jeff! Hi, Dan! My land! Granny's eyes sparkle like sunshine on dewdrops. I'll make some breakfast right away. What you see in Ackerton? Dan asked eagerly. What you see in Ackerton, Jeff? Hang on to your horses, Jeff laughed. I'll tell you in good time. Granny, I sold your tapestries. Did you now? Couldn't get what they're worth, though, Jeff said sadly. Land had no idea they were worth anything. I got two hundred dollars. Jeff! Granny almost dropped the kitten. I did, Granny. Four times as much as I told you I'd get. And there's a place for more. 
granny stroked the kitten and there was a look of near sadness in her eyes after a moment she said gently it seems almost sinful that much for aught so small it's not jeff assured her the man who bought them from me will make a profit too he can do that and welcome he is land who would have thought it two hundred dollars half would do me for a year all would do you for two years granny shook her head no jeff for sixty-four years i've abided here and never had a hundred dollars all at once never missed it either except when enos was sick i might have paid a doctor for him if you see fit to give me half i'll take it should i have need of aught that is not at my hand half is yours jeff hesitated he worked for profit but somehow it hadn't seemed right to make any on granny still as far as she was concerned a hundred dollars was a vast sum and obviously she had gone as far as she intended to go granny laughed we'll leave it that way and i'll have more t oh hang i keep forgetting the name more claws the next time you go it seems a mort of pay for what pleasures me so dear now i'll rouse up some eatables she baked delicious pancakes fried a heaping platter of sausage and put them on the table granny and dan listened intently prompting him if he omitted the smallest detail as jeff told everything about his trip to ackerton when he had finished he looked pointedly at dan declaring and finally i arrange for you to go back to school in september i'm not going dan said firmly you must go jeff urged dan you and i can build up a good business here but unless we always want to carry peddlers packs one of us has to know business methods the place to learn them is in school i want to carry a pack you'll have your chance it isn't going to work that fast think of ten or maybe even fifteen years from now imagine a trading post in smithville and a store in ackerton with blazer and tarrant enterprises in gold letters a foot high across both of them jeff grinned we could cut out the limited if we were partners we wouldn't be limited any more dan said stubbornly i can't go could you if if you were satisfied about your pop dan hesitated you promise jeff i promise before i go before you go then dan sighed i reckon i can go back good jeff said quickly now i want you to stay here and keep pal with you i'm going away for a little while where are you going jeff into smithville and i'm taking the shotgun i'm going with you not this time i have to go alone but it's wisdom he speaks granny said softly you bide here dan well when you coming back jeff i don't know exactly but i will be back you take a care now don't be fretting about me jeff grinned but he was not grinning when with the shotgun in his right hand and the paper loaded shells in his pocket he left granny's house and hit the trail back to smithville the time for a showdown was here jeff planned as he walked he had always known that he would stop wandering and settle down when and if he found a place he liked well enough and he liked these hills though he'd never been able to imagine himself confined to any one small spot the hills were not small they presented a challenge he liked the fact that he'd have to fight for his right to be here and that there were problems to be solved was not extraordinary he'd always had to fight and there'd always been problems jeff knew suddenly what he had never known before his whole life had been almost desperately lonely he hadn't thought of it in such a light because there had been no fair basis for comparison never having been anything except lonely he could not know what it was to be otherwise now he had dan granny pal and a genuine love for all three they were his and having them was good he had no illusions about becoming very rich for he saw no great wealth in the offing there would be a comfortable living 
with always enough variety so that there would be continual zest the hill people needed what the outside world could offer but without someone to act as intermediary they had almost no chance of getting it those of the outside world delighted in the products of the hills and they had the money to pay for them nobody would be cheated jeff put these thoughts behind him first things must always be first and before he did anything else he had to meet and fight whoever was gunning for him for dan's sake and his own conscience he must bring to justice whoever had shot johnny blazer he could do neither with words for it had come to guns but before he could use the shotgun effectively he had to have live ammunition for it he wished mightily that he had left at least one shell loaded wanting only to see if anything had been disturbed there jeff swung aside when he came to johnny blazer's cabin he entered inside each man armed with a rifle that swung at once to cover jeff were pete barr yancey grant and dab whitney end of chapter 10Chapter 11 of Trading Jeff and His Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas. Trading Jeff and His Dog by Jim Kilgard. Chapter 11 The Talking Tree. They stood along the wall unkept and untidy but there was something about them that was as cold and deadly as the whine of a bullet or the fangs of a viper they were lean as weasels and as fast the rifles they held from the repeating carbines belonging to barr yancey dab and grant to pete's single shot fifty caliber seemed a part of them and they had grown up with those rifles these were men who had no shots to waste and who therefore must make every one count. They would be shamed if they shot a turkey or grouse anywhere except through the head, and they had only raunchous cheers for whoever was unable to shoot as well. Turn around, Pete ordered gruffly. Not here, you fool, Barr countermanded the order. A fair half of Smithville will come a-racin'. Pete sneered. Let em come. They won't find us no obviously barr was in command this goes my way jeff stood cold and shaken and knowing that when he walked into the cabin he had walked into his own death these must be the men about whom bill ellis had warned him but why should the whitneys want to kill him summoning all his past experience with Terret enterprises ltd which had taught him to try to appear outwardly cool in the hottest of spots Jeff did his best to seem not only calm, but to take full command of the situation. "'You're in my cabin,' he said quietly. "'We know. Pete's eyes were venom-laden. But you won't be needing it for long.' The rest of the Whitney's said nothing. Jeff studied them and tried, by reading their faces, to determine his next act. Pete, so poisoned with hatred that it distorted his face, offered nothing Yancey, Dab, and Grant might be swayed if it were not for Barr. Dominating the rest and with them, at the same time he stood apart from them. He was strong. Pete was weak. And for that very reason, extremely dangerous. The rest needed leadership. But while there was no lust in Barr's eyes, neither was there any mercy. Jeff looked steadily at him and kept his voice quiet. What's it about? We liked you, peddler. Barr's voice was very grave. We liked you and you traded fair with your goods. But there's no bit of room in these hills for a policeman. Policeman? Jeff exploded. We know Barr seemed downcast as though someone he trusted had betrayed him. The boy told us. Told you what? All. Oh, and twill serve you not to plead or ask pardon. If you're a man, be one now. Jeff's head twirled. Apparently, while he was in Ackerton, one or more of the Whitneys had met Dan, and the boy had spun some fantastic tale. 
Jeff looked over his captors again and saw only unyielding determination. He took a deep breath before he spoke. What did Dan tell you? Enough, Barr grunted. We had the truth from a babe's mouth. But, Dab interrupted. What made you set your mind on the thought that a Whitney killed Blazer? Didn't you? We do not pry into killings, Barr said. You erred when you did. Another piece fitted into the puzzle. Evidently, Dan had told whoever it was he had met that he and Jeff were out to avenge Johnny, and doubtless he had said that Jeff was an officer. Jeff pondered Deb's question and Barr's comment. It was possible, even probable, that only his killer knew who had shot Johnny. Whoever was guilty would be a fool if he was anything except closed mouth about it. Shooting, Pete said nasally, twill serve not to do elsewise. I said we'd wait. Barr growled. Jeff breathed a little easier. The Whitneys intended to shoot him, but not immediately, and he wondered what they were waiting for and why. Perhaps, as Barr had mentioned, they were too close to Smithville, and in order to remain unseen, perhaps they would wait until night to take him out. Maybe there were other reasons, but evidently he had a little time. Jeff took a shot in the dark. I'll be missed in Ackerton. We know, Barr muttered. The boy said it all. Jeff moistened dry lips with his tongue. His chance shot had ricocheted. Whatever story Dan had concocted tied in with Jeff's trip to Ackerton. He had to think his way out of this. People will be looking for me. They won't find you, Barr promised. But could be they'll find us. Jeff said pointedly, five against one? You had a shotgun when you come in. And if I'd known who was waiting, I'd have come shooting. But you can all cheer up. Maybe those who'd look for me won't expect to need guns. And you can take them just like you did me. Maybe they won't even have guns. Then you can shoot them down from ambush like you did Johnny Blazer. Six pair of eyes regarded him, and only Pete's remained unchanged. The rest shifted from deliberate purposefulness to cold fury, and Barr's face turned white. His lips tautened, and he bit his words off and spat them at Jeff. Ye lie. I do not lie. Swiftly, Barr closed the distance between them. His left hand snaked forward, and his open palm struck Jeff's cheek. It was not a blow that a man might offer a worthy antagonist, but an insulting slap. Barr's eyes were glowing coals. Ye lie, policeman, nary a man in the hill shot Blazer that away. Jeff snarled back. I don't lie, and I can prove it. His face still white, Barr stepped back. He jerked his rifle to a shooting position and lowered it reluctantly. Tense his stretched buckskin, he studied Jeff and snapped. Say those words again. Johnny Blazer not only had no gun when he was shot, but whoever shot him was hiding when he did it, Jeff pronounced each word very slowly and very clearly, as though he were rehearsing careful speech. How did ye know he lacked aught to shoot back? I, Jeff thought of Bill Ellis and caught himself in time. I saw someone who found him on my Ackerton trip. Johnny had no gun when they picked him up. Shut up, Barr twirled furiously on his cousin who had started to speak. He said, more to himself than to anyone else, Blazer's gun was found in his cabin. Jeff laughed tauntingly. You hillbillies are brave men. Now all you have to do is admit that whoever shot Johnny was hiding in the brush. Still furious, Barr regarded him steadily. How do you know that? All I had to do was look. What'd you look at? Jeff answered contemptuously. I wouldn't expect any of you to think that far, but the bullet went clear through Johnny. There are enough trees and shrubs around, so it had to nick one of them. It's easy to figure the angle it came from. Jeff held his breath. He himself had not thought of this until now, but it had to be right. Johnny Blazer was a woodsman. If whoever shot him had been in the open, Johnny would have seen him. Because he was unarmed, he probably would have died anyhow but he would have died in the brush, for he would have at least had tried to escape. 
Slow thinking Dad digested Jeff's statement and spoke solemnly. Hit's right, Barr. None among us thought to look. Barr was momentarily bewildered. None saw the need. But need there might be. Go look, Dab. I go too, Pete offered. Dab's going. Rifle in the crook of his arm, Dab left the cabin. Jeff waited uneasily. Dab's education might be a bit short in the conjunction of verbs and more complex forms of mathematics, but it had taught him all about ballistics. When he came back, he would know whether or not Johnny had been shot from ambush. If he hadn't been, Jeff looked at Barr's stormy eyes and shuddered. Twenty minutes later, Dab returned. He came slowly and somewhat shrunkenly, as though he had been both derided and belittled. He stood in the doorway, not looking at the rest, and when he spoke, his voice was muffled and reluctant. Kids true, Barr. Kids true enough. Who's ever shot Blazer was crouching in a little patch of evergreens, a hundred and fifty steps from that road, he said as though that was vastly important. With my own eyes I saw his crouch. He broke some twigs, better to see. Something came into the cabin with him, an unseen but heavy and mournful something that seemed, within itself, to rob everyone of the power of speech. The Whitneys looked sideways at each other, and Barr spoke slowly. Thus she saw, thus I saw. Where did the lead strike, the tree? Deb answered dully, hits buried in the tree. There was silence which Barr broke with a soul desolated cry. This day I know shame. They were weighted as though by heavy burdens, and Jeff understood why they scrounged themselves. By the cowardly action of one of their number, something they could never get back had been taken from all of them. They must hang their heads because among them walked a man who was not a man. Jeff rubbed salt into their wounds. You can all be proud of yourself. It was as though they did not hear this terrible crime, this hideous sin, had been committed, but they did not want to believe. Grant said hopefully, maybe it twere an outlander. Twere no outlander, Barr muttered. Twas a hillman. Jeff trembled, fired with another idea. If the tree could talk, he had thought, it might tell who shot Johnny Blazer. The tree could talk. Are you afraid to find out who did it? he challenged. Barr glared at him. And how do we do that? Dig the bullet out of the tree. Pay no heed to him, Pete intoned. He would but tangle us and lead us from him. Hold your tongue, Barr ordered gruffly. No man walks safe with one among us who shoots men as he would a varmint. Get the bullet, Dab. Dab left a second time, and Jeff hoped his wildly beating heart could not be heard. To these mountain men, killing was right, as long as men met in a fair fight. But it was soul-blackening, the extreme depths of degradation, to kill as Johnny Blazer's killer had. And that killer was about to be known. Only one rifle could have fired the fatal shot, and the hill men would recognize that bullet and know who had fired it. Or would they? For the Whitney's present carried thirty caliber rifles, and there must be more in the hills. Jeff's hopes alternately rose and waned. Then Deb came back and held up the leaden slug so all could see. Four pair of eyes swung accusingly on Pete, trooming where it had struck Johnny and then the tree. The slug still retained its shape where it had fitted its brass shell. There would be no mistake. It was a fifty caliber. Sweat broke out on Pete's forehead. Hit, hit, weren't me. Bar spat, tore you. He, he stole pelts out of my traps. You met him unfair. Pete half screamed. He had a rifle and shot four I did. Bar said relentlessly. Where was his rifle? I, I brought it back here. He had no rifle. You lay like a whiskered cat a four mouse's den and gave him no fairness. Do not add a lie to cowardice. Jeff said eagerly, Now you know, Barr, now all of you know, and Dan did part of the truth. I promised him that we'd find out who shot his father. It was all we wanted and all we will want. I'm not a policeman. 
Barr looked squarely at him. So you say. It's true. Go to Ackerton and find out what I did there, and think a little. Neither the Whitneys nor anyone else can take the law into their own hands and forever keep it there. Do the right thing now. And what is that? Take Pete into Smithville and turn him over to Bill Ellis. He'll get a fair trial. Pa, Yancey exploded. Give our kin into the law's keep. Tis best to shoot him ourselves. Stop the talking. Barr was still looking at Jeff. You say ye are a peddler and naught else. I say so. Yet you saw fit to beholden yourself to the boy. You took it upon yourself to tell him you'd settle with who's ever shot his father. I did. Then be ye peddler or policeman, ye shall. What do you mean? We'll bide here through the day, Barb pronounced. With the night we shall go to the cabin on Trilly Ridge. You have a shotgun, and Barr inclined a contemporous head toward Pete. He has a rifle. With the dawn, both at the same time, you'll walk on Trilly Ridge. If you come down the ridge, peddler, you'll be free to come and go among us. If Pete comes down it, he has a twenty-four hours to leave the hills. I shall sit with ye in the cabin. Grant, Dab, and Yancey shall be at the front of Twilly Ridge. To shoot should one of ye flee rather than fight. Grant, Dab, and Yancey nodded solemn agreement. Jeff's head reeled. With tomorrow's dawn, he was to fight a death duel with Pete Whitney. Barr would be with them all night to make sure that things went according to his fantastic plan. Dab, Grant, and Yancey would be waiting to kill whoever violated the terms of the duel. If Jeff won, even though he would be privileged to remain in the hills, he would have killed a man. Regardless of what happened or who won, the Whitneys would have rid themselves of an unwelcome kinsman and closed the mouth of one who might be a policeman. Jeff licked dry lips. He had never killed a man, and knew that he could never kill. He tried to think of some way out, of something he could, and there was nothing. Jeff licked his lips again. What say you? Barr demanded. It's, it's a crazy idea. Tis what you wanted, what you told the boy you'd get. I didn't tell him I'd get it this way. For heaven's sakes, man, listen to reason. The law, and not me, should take care of this. Barr's eyes flamed. Are ye a policeman? No. The boy said different. Maybe, Grant said slowly. "'Twould be best to shoot him. "'I'll go on Trilly Ridge with, with who used to be my kin.' "'Jeff heaved a great sigh. First things first, always a new customer down the road. "'And if he went on the ridge, he would have time to think. "'If he did not, his hours were numbered anyway. "'He said slowly, "'Let it be your way, Barr.' "'Barr said quietly, "'Tis well you say so, for twould not be right should a Whitney shoot a Whitney, or be shot by one. Do ye lack aught? My pack. Barr looked curiously at him, but Jeff made no attempt to satisfy his curiosity. He had always been able to pull almost anything he needed out of his pack, and there should be something to help him now. He couldn't think of what it was, but the pack had been a part of him for so long. He would feel better if he had it. Where's the pack? Barr asked. At Granny Wilson's. Get it and fetch it, Barr directed Yancey. Do you need aught else? Jeff's brain was still twirling. No. Barr glanced inquiringly at Pete, who stared like a vicious animal and said nothing. There was finality in Barr's words. Ask no more, for it shall not be given. Both have had your say. The words hammered dully at Jeff's ears. Then he awoke with a start and swallowed twice. For the first time, he became aware of the shotgun shells that awaited his pocket. They were even more harmless than so many stones, for they were still loaded with paper. But he had been given a chance to speak, and he had not spoken. Pal went wild with joy when Jeff returned from Ackerton. He stayed as close as he could get, for he had missed his master greatly and needed him sorely. He smirked at the white kitten when he spotted it, but made no hostile move because Jeff had brought it. Woolly contented, Pal lay at Jeff's feet while he breakfasted and talked with Granny and Dan. When Jeff rose to leave, 
pal danced happily to the door and wagged his tail in anticipation. Everything was once more as it had been and should be. They were about to go peddling together on the trails. The big dog glanced back to see if Dan was coming too. Instead, the boy grasped his collar. You stay here. Pal flattened his ears and dropped his tail, but he was not allowed to go. For a full minute, he stood hopefully in front of the door. Then he went sadly back into the kitchen. Playing with the ball of paper that Granny had wadded up and thrown on the floor, the fluffy kitten arched its back and spat. Pal paid no attention. His heart was heavy, and joy had gone with Jeff. All the rest of the morning he was a wooden dog who did not even rouse himself when Yancey Whitney came to the door, said that Jeff wanted his pack and went away with it. That afternoon he followed Dan about the hill, but he had no eyes for the sheep, the cow, the mule, and he lacked zest even for chasing blackbirds that came to pillage Granny's garden. He cared only about the trail up which Jeff had come and down which he had gone again. That night, after Dan and Granny had gone to bed, Pal padded restlessly over to the door. Eagerly, he sniffed every wind that blew and every scent that tickled his nose. He knew when six steer, feeling safe in the cover of night, came out of the forest and climbed the hill to graze in the sheep pasture. He heard a mouse rustle, and he was aware when a night flying owl cruised past the door. All these things he smelled or heard. He felt only the absence of his master. The night was very deep and very black when Pal's yearning for Jeff became unbearable. He pushed his nose against the door, and when he did so, the latch rattled slightly. He pricked up his ears and bent his head toward the noise, but he did not understand any of the mysterious ways of which people fasten things. Slowly he reared against the door, sniffing at every crack, Getting down, he trembled anxiously. Then, inch by inch, he began a second inspection of the door. It was completely accidental when, in raising his head, he pushed the latch upward and the door swung open. Pal did not linger to think about anything else. He knew only that the way was clear. He flew into the night, found Jeff's trail, and raced along it. At Johnny Blazer's cabin, he scented Jeff's trail and that of the five Whitneys. The pack lad and Leancey had gone back there, leading into the hills. Pal followed along. He halted momentarily at the foot of Trilly Ridge, for Dab Whitney was sitting on a big rock, and the smell of his pipe was rank and heavy in the darkness. Pal slipped past, knowing that he could not be seen in the night. He caught the odor of wood smoke then mingled with it, with the sense of Pete and Bar Whitney and of Jeff. Abandoning the trail, Pal followed his nose to his beloved master. He came to the cabin and scratched on the door. End of Chapter 11 Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas Chapter 12 of Trading Jeff and His Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas. Trading Jeff and His Dog by Jim Kilgard. Chapter 12 Surprise. They came to the cabin on Trilly Ridge after dark, Jeff and Pete walking side by side and Barr silent behind them. Jeff balanced the pack on his shoulders and was glad he had it there. It was an old friend and had always been a true one. He had been in trouble many times while it was on his shoulders, but he had never stayed in trouble. As they walked, he tried to pinpoint directions, but because of the darkness, he could not do so. They had left the road for a pass so faint that the casual traveler would not even see it as he passed. There was another path and still another, and all of it was country that the hillmen knew well, but that Jeff did not know at all. When they finally reached the cabin, he was sure only that it was north of the road, but it would not have been an unpleasant journey if Pete had not been walking with him. 
found out, Pete had retreated sullenly into himself, and Jeff again thought of an animal. But Pete was no ordinary savage thing that might attack because it was hungry or seeking a fight. He planned, and hidden behind his weak blue eyes was a crafty brain. Jeff knew that Pete's only thought revolved around ways to kill him, and it was a cold thing to know. The men came to the cabin, and Barr said, This is it. Jeff spoke over his shoulder. You sure the place isn't haunted? No haunts. Barr seemed perplexed, as though there was something about the mission he no longer understood. Push the door and go in. Sure, Jeff said agreeably. He opened the door and felt Pete go tense beside him. Jeff gripped his shotgun with both hands, preparing to bring it crashing down on the man's head. Pete would kill without imperiling himself, if he could and almost his only chance would occur when they entered the dark cabin. But Barr knew this, too. Stay here, he ordered his cousin, and to Jeff. Got a match in your pocket? Yep. Go in by yourself and light it. Strike hit to the tallow candle that'll be setting on the table. Jeff entered, felt the cabin's walls enclose him, and had a strange feeling that Barr Whitney was a complete fool. It would be simple to swing suddenly, cock the shotgun as he swung, and always supposing he had some live ammunition, send the leaden hell back through the door. Then he understood. Barr was no fool. He had nearly gauged Jeff and he knew men. He had known that Pete would turn and shoot if sent in first, but Jeff would not. Besides, Jeff thought wryly, Though Pete might be forced to stand in any line of fire that might sweep out the door, Barr would be elsewhere. Jeff took a match from his pocket, struck it, and looked around the cabin. It was one fairly large room, and at the far end was a natural stone fireplace. There was a table, three chairs, two double bunks built one on top of the other, cooking utensils hanging from wooden pegs driven into the wall, and small windows. The cabin was either a bachelor's home or else it had used only on occasion by some person or persons who had reason to spend time here. Jeff touched his dying match to the fat tallow candle that stood on the table and flicked the burned match onto the floor. Come on in, he said cheerfully, and welcome to our happy home. Pete's face was cold, and that was almost the only expression. He strolled to a chair, pulled it away from the table, and sat down with his rifle across his lap. Jeff stood his shotgun in a corner and turned to face Barr. Snug little den, he said pleasantly. Barr looked puzzled and said nothing. However, the burning determination and the sternness were partly gone from his face. This was serious business. But Jeff was not accepting it seriously. Never flicking his eyes from his captives, Barr pulled a chair very close to the door. Here we be, he pronounced, and here we stay till the sun lightens the topmost twigs on the big pines. That's cute, Jeff declared admirably. That's really cute. Barr glared at him. What is? Your description. Till the sun lightens the topmost twigs on the big pines. Not exactly poetry, but it has a poetic spirit. Well, if we're going to be here all night, we should do something besides glare at each other. He slid out the pack, laid it on the table, and stretched. Then he stifled a yawn. He'd had no sleep last night, and evidently he'd get none tonight. But more than once he had to stay awake, as long, and he could do it again. If ye be weary, Barr indicated the bunks, you might sleep. Thanks, Jeff declined, but I'm afraid I'd have bad dreams. Besides, this may be my last chance to talk with you. What'll we talk about, Barr? Barr broke out suddenly. I can't plumb you, can't plumb you at all. Jeff said smoothly, it's easy. I'm not a complex person. I'll tell you my life story if you want to hear it. Won't cost you a cent. I swan, Barr ejaculated. I could like you a lot if I didn't, if you didn't think I was a policeman. Sorry, I can't change your mind on that subject, but I'm not. Barr's eyes searched Jeff's. Why'd the boy say it? Jeff shrugged. If I knew why boys say things, I'd be a lot smarter than I am. But you did tell the boy you'd find out who killed Blazer. Yep. 
Yet now you got the chance, you'd pass it by. This is a chance. I don't want to kill anybody. I never promised Dan anything except that we'd find his father's murderer. Afterwards, I was going to turn him over to the law. Barr wrinkled his brow. But ye be no policeman. I'm not, Jeff said flatly. Barr, what had you intended to do with me? It was Barr's turn to shrug. Shoot you. And in your opinion, that was right? Barr said fiercely. A body don't stop to think, should he tromp on its head, does he find a prison snake on his heartstone? Jeff lapsed into silence. His life story he had offered in jest, but he understood Barr's. His ancestors had been among the first to come to America, and they had come because there wasn't room enough for them in Europe. But neither had there been room enough in America's scattered colonies for people so fierce, reckless, and proud. They had either left the settlements of their own accord or had been driven out. They had wanted above all to live by their own personal inclinations and not by rules which they had little part in making. Always they had sought the wildest and most inaccessible places because only there could they live as they must. Bar Whitney typified this wild independence, which couldn't possibly endure. Sooner or later, even the hill clans must submit to the forward march of civilization, and Jeff hoped that the advancing juggernaut would not crush them completely. The spirit they represented always had been and always would be necessary to free people. Probably the older ones would go down fighting. Certainly they would never learn that they must bend themselves to others. Perhaps their children or their children's children would. Jeff shrugged. That was to come. This was now, and neither civilization nor anything else had as yet tamed Bar Whitney. Jeff rubbed a hand on his trousers. You ill? Bar asked. My hand's twitching. The oil of shunk and the grease of bar mix two of one to one of the other and cooked on hickory fire when the moon's near horn points to water will drive out airy itch. Jeff grinned. Can't wait for the moon's near horn to point to water. And besides, I don't want a cure. When my hand twitches, I'm lucky. Pete moved so swiftly that he seemed in one split second to be sitting on his chair and then magically to be standing with his rifle at half raise. But quick as he was, Barr was quicker. His rifle cracked. A lock of hair detached itself from Pete's head to float softly to the floor. And before the sound died, Barr had leveled another cartridge into the chamber. He spoke as casually as though he had just shot at a squirrel. Nexon's going through your head, Pete. Sit down. Pete sat. Barr grinned. Jeff dared to let himself think of the prospect that awaited. Tomorrow morning, side by side, and at exactly the same time, Jeff and Pete would be allowed to leave the cabin. Jeff pulled his stomach in as though he could already feel Pete's slug ripping through it. Again, he pondered escaping, but all of he could think was what he had already considered. If he ran, one of the waiting Whitney's would shoot him down when he came off the ridge. There was little chance of doing anything tonight. Barr was along to see that he didn't. He couldn't protect himself with paper bullets. Jeff had a wild notion of twirling as they stepped out the door smash him Pete over the head with the muzzle of a shotgun, and tried to claim him as prisoner. But that was a very wild plan which had almost no chance of success. Pete was far too quick and far too expert a rifleman. Jeff put such thoughts behind him. No man could do anything well if he tried to do more than one thing at a time. And first things must be first, he shivered. How about a fire bar? Lay a blaze if you want. Bar's wood in the box. Jeff laid a fire, lighted it, and stood with his back to the fireplace as flames crackled. He looked at a darkened window and had a curious thought that this night would never end. It should, he decided, have passed long ago. But when he looked at his watch, it was only half past nine. He should be hungry, but he wasn't. They'd eaten in Johnny Blazer's cabin, and now he was too nervous to eat. 
After a very long interval, he looked again at his watch. It was a quarter to ten. Jeff glanced at his pack and created mental images of the goods it contained. There were knives, fishing tackle, a half dozen new mouth organs, fiddle strings, gay ribbons, scissors, needles. He had brought only what hill people wanted, and among all of it, he could not think of a single article that would help him now. Jeff set his jaw. Maybe if there was something to do, Tom would not drag so slowly. And besides, he could think better when he was busy. Play cards, he invited. No, Barr shook his head. Oh, come on. Barr tipped his head toward Pete, who sat motionless with his rifle across his lap. Unmoving, he missed nothing and was ready at a split-second notice to take advantage of anything that offered. Take his rifle away, Jeff urged. You can still watch him. A body has a right to keep his rifle. He sure is nursing it, Jeff felt reckless. How about sitting in, Pete? We don't have to shoot each other before morning. Pete refused to answer. Jeff pulled his chair to the table and tried to entertain himself with solitaire. But he was too tense and strained to concentrate. And when he found himself adding the four of hearts to the seven of spades, he shoved the cards across the table and let them lay there. Restlessly, he threw another chunk of wood on the fire and turned to Barr. With no noise and almost without effort, Barr rose. His eyes were alert and his face was intent. He backed so that while continuing to command the cabin and the two in it, he could control the door, too. There was a raspy scratch on the door and Barr said softly, See what's thar, see who's a visitin'. Jeff opened the door and Pal panted in. His ears were flat and his tail hanged all as, giving Barr a wide berth and glancing suspiciously at Pete, he went to the far end of the cabin and stood. Not knowing whether or not he was to be punished for leaving Granny's, he looked expectantly at his master. Jeff laughed and twitched his fingers. Come here, you old flea cage. Grinning happily, Pal came at once and Jeff brushed his shaggy head with an affectionate hand. He was less tense and strangely, his anxiety lessened. The great dog wagged an ecstatic tail while Jeff continued to pat his head. For a short space, delighted to be near each other once more, neither had paid attention to anything else. Pal licked Jeff's face with big, sloppy tongue and wagged everything from his muzzle to the tip of his tail. He turned to growl at Barr and Pete, and Barr flicked his rifle. I wouldn't leave him try it. I won't, Jeff promised. He slipped two fingers beneath Pal's collar, led him over to the table and sat down. Bending over Pal, as though continuing to caress him, he hoped Barr could not hear his pounding heart, and was glad his eyes were hidden. After a moment, Jeff raised his head. He looked too casually at the candle that flickered a foot from his hand. Trying to appear disinterested, he gauged Pete's exact distance and Barr's position. He moistened dry lips with his tongue and reviewed his suddenly formed plan. Even though he risked a burnt hand doing it, he was positive that he could snuff the candle out before Barr could shoot. Then he'd tip the table over and fight his way out. Jeff nibbled his lower lip and looked doubtfully at Pal. Barr was civil as an ill and strong as an ox. Jeff might need help, and could he count on Pal? Barr asked suspiciously, What you flustered about? Jeff muttered silently at himself. He had a plan. If it was desperate, the situation called for desperate measures, but everything depended on surprise. To give Barr the slightest warning would also give him time to shoot Jeff. It went without saying that he would then be able to shoot Pal, and Jeff hadn't the least doubt that Barr would be happy to do both. He forced a laugh. It's just nice to see something around here that's not all hell-bent to shoot something else. Barr remained alert. Where'd you get Blazer's dog? Found him over beyond Cressman, Jeff said truthfully. Do you keep dogs? Hounds, Barr admitted. Wouldn't pester myself with a no-count dog such as that. Jeff cast for a way to lull Barr. Depends on what you want in a dog, wouldn't you say? Could. What do you want? 
Jeff did his best to look like a man who faces a desperate situation, but who was mildly cheered because his dog saw fit to track him down. If he did everything exactly right, and with split-second precision, his plan had at least an even chance of working. Escape would not solve everything. Pete would still be unpunished, and if the Whitneys should meet him, Jeff, again, they would not bother to take him prisoner. They'd shoot on sight. But he could name Johnny Blazer's killer. That would start things, and maybe he'd be able to finish them. Regardless of what might happen in the future, this was now. Jeff had to get out of the cabin before he could do anything else. But it was as though Barr could read his mind. You're pondering, he accused. Is that a crime in these hills? If, Barr said deliberately, you try to make a break, I'll kill you in your tracks. I have spoke it. Jeff said irritably, don't be a darn fool. Don't you be one other. You're getting a chance. Yes, Jeff sighed, a big chance. He looked again at the candle. Any of your hounds ever get you out of jail, Barr? Pah! How might a hound do such? Well, pal got me out. Those words I mistrust. He did, Jeff insisted. It was in Cressman. He told of the Cressman jail and of how he was literally thrown out of it because, when he played the mouth organ, pal howled. He spoke of inquiring the way to Delview as a roost to throw Pop and Joe Parker from his trail, for he suspected that they intended to have him rearrested there. Instead of going to Delview, he had come over the hills to Smithville. Barr chuckled derisively. Peddle and teach you such tall tales. It's true. Ha! You toot music and the dog howls. Let me show you. Jeff took a mouth organ from his pack. Blew a soft note, and Pal responded with a moaning wail that trailed out on a soft soprano note. Barr seemed dumbfounded. Dog gone. Jeff's eyes strayed to the candle. Barr rose, wrenched it from its drippings, and put it down at the far end of the table. He resumed his seat. I can see best when that's there, he announced grimly. You wantin' to have notions about that candle, was you? Why, no, of course not. Jeff managed to appear innocent even while he mentally kicked himself. His chance had come and gone. There'd be another chance, and Barr seemed more at ease. This night I learnt what I knew not. A dog howls to noise. This one does. Make him do hit again. Tis a mighty curious thing. Jeff blew another note, and Pal howled again. Barr's eyes sparkled. An elemental creature himself, he was interested in the elemental, and this fascinated him. He must find the answer, but while seeking it, he did not forget to keep his eyes on Jeff and Pete. Why does he do hit? he asked. I don't know, Jeff admitted. Can't figure it myself. Have him do hit some more. At the first note, Pal obliged with the banshee well that subsided, then gathered force and mounted again. The sound filled the cabin and offered the illusion of being not only real, but all reality. It was as though the door burst open of its own accord, and Jeff rubbed his eyes in disbelief. Ike Wilson stood framed in the doorway. He was slim, supple, smiling, but behind the smile there was something hard as stone, and there was nothing to provoke humor in the cocked, double-barreled shotgun he carried. Half erect in his chair, Barr froze there. Pete's face turned white. Ike grinned happily. Hi, peddler. Hi, Ike. Where the blazes did you come from? Broadview Prison. Stopped by Granny's and she told me you was about. Heard the dog howl and calculated you'd be nigh. His chuckle was rich and very audible. I didn't expect a whole nest of you. Good thing. I peered in the window glass afore I come in. Barr snarled. This ain't your mix. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is my mix. Now just hand me that little old rifle gun bar, stock forward. Fighting against so doing, but unable to help himself, Barr relinquished his rifle. Ike threw it through the open door. Now, Pete, he coaxed, I need jern. Pete remained rooted, smiling, but with a deadly something behind the smile. 
Ike tightened his finger on the shotgun's trigger. Don't like to shoot set in patages, but I will. Pete handed his rifle over. Ike tossed it out and slammed the door. Holding the shotgun with one hand, he drew a length of buckskin from his pocket and whipped it straight. He spoke as though he were addressing a petulant child. Now just put your hands behind the chair bar. This shotgun might go off accidental-like, and it makes quite a hole. Tight-lipped, Barr did as he was ordered. Expertly, Ike laced his hands and then his feet. He approached Jeff apologetically. Feared I'll have to tie you too, peddler. But now don't give me no fuss. Ike rubbed the friendly pal's head. Just do like Uncle Ike says. Jeff thrust his hands behind the chair and permitted himself to be bound. Ike slipped a rawhide thong through Paul's collar and tied him to the chair rung. He stood erect and looked around, his manner that of one who had just done a job and done it well. Jeff asked, What's the big idea, Ike? Ike chuckled again. Business. Say, how come these Whitneys had a gun on you? Barr, Jeff inclined his head, had the idea that I'm a policeman. For snort's sake, Ike faced Barr. Your brain's soft. He's a peddler and a good'un. You ought to know. I was in jail with him. Leave me loose, Barr snarled, and I won't hurt you. Pears to me you won't anyhow. You'll not get back down the ridge. Now, now, Ike soothed. Just leave that to Uncle Ike. I got up, di didn't I? Ike twirled to face Pete, and something inside of Jeff turned cold. He had seen angry men, but suddenly he knew that not even Barr Whitney was as strong in anger as Ike Wilson. It was an inward quality. For outwardly he remained very gentle, and he did not raise his voice. I come for Bucky. Pete muttered sullenly, Got nothing to do with Bucky. Oh, yes, you have, Ike corrected him. Yes, you have. Bucky's still in Broadview, but you're going to help get him out. Bet that if you strained yourself, you could mind the night we got Wheeler's chickens. You was going to stay behind, you said and leave us know should somebody come. But when the police come, you was a long way behind. What'd they pay you for turning us in, Pete? Sweat glistened on Pete's brow. I had naught to do with it. You'll never get anywhere, Pete, lying in such a way. Are you coming like a little man, or am I going to scatter your spare parts from here to Cressman? Pete gasped. What you going to do with me? Just lay in the hills, Ike soothed. Leastwhile, we stay there till I can send word to that smart Joe Parker. Going to tell him, I am, that I know who stuck up the Crestman Bank. Going to tell him that, when Bucky comes into the hills, he'll find that man tied to a tree. I reckon Parker'll swap for that. If he doesn't, Jeff said suddenly, you can offer more. Pete killed Johnny Blazer. He did? Ike's eyes glowed eagerly. Now I know I got me a swap. Come long, Pete. Herding his captive, he started for the door. Suddenly he stopped and ordered, Wait there. Pete stood still. Ike glided to Jeff, sliced the bonds that tied his hands, and bent to whisper, Give me five minutes, peddler, just five minutes, and kiss Granny for me. I will, Jeff promised, and I'll tell her that you'll deliver one to her yourself in a few days. He waited ten minutes before stooping to untie his feet. He rose, and before free and bar, he glanced out one of the small windows. The first ten of dawn was in the sky, and the horizon was endless. He had found binding ties in these hills, but somehow he had found limitless freedom, too. End of chapter 12 Jim Kellegard was born in New York City. Happily enough, he was still in the preschool age when his father decided to move the family to Pennsylvania mountains. There, young Jim grew up among some of the best hunting and fishing in the United States. He says, If I had pursued my scholastic duties as diligently as I did dear, 
trout, grouse, squirrels, etc., I might have had better report cards. Jim Kellegard has worked at various jobs. Trapper, teamster, guide, surveyor, factory worker, and laborer. When he was in the late 20s, he decided to become a full-time writer. He has published several hundred short stories and articles, and quite a few books for young people. His hobbies are hunting, fishing, dogs, and questing for new stories. He tells us, Story hunts have led me from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and from the Arctic Circle to Mexico City. Stories, like gold, are where you find them. You may discover one 3,000 miles from home, or as in The Spell of the White Sturgeon, right on your own doorstep. And he adds, I'm married to a very beautiful girl and have a teenage daughter. Both of them order me around in a shameful fashion, but I can still boss the dog. We live in Phoenix, Arizona. End of book. End of Trading Jeff and His Dog by Jim Kilgard.